Welcome to another episode of uh, Catalyzing Radical Systemic Change, where it's all about mapping, discovering and cross-pollinating what I think are the necessary steps towards a planetary civilization ahead. I'm very grateful today to meet in this uh, virtual room uh, Louise. Louise is the CEO of Volans. And my first question for you today, Louise, is for me, uh, Volans has always been, and the precursor to Volans, one of the North Stars uh, in my whole career of sustainability over the last 15 years. So I'm curious, what made Louise the CEO of Volans? And I would also like um, you to sketch what Volans is actually doing before we start diving deeper in our dialogue. Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Alistair. Um, so you talked about the precursor to Volans. So let me start there. So Volans was set up in 2008 um, by John L. Kington, who was the founder before that of the company Sustainability. And, and Volans really came out of sustainability and some people who came out of the World Economic Forum and the Schwab Foundation with this view to looking really at systemic change. Um, and in the first instance, bridging from social entrepreneurship into business, um, really. So that's that's where it came from. Um, and, and I guess the role is we're still looking at systemic change. We're still very focused on the business world as the, as the main entry point. We, we work with policymakers, we work with NGOs and, and, and others, but business tends to be our main entry point. And, um, uh, and how I got involved, just to start to go to that piece, is um, I, I've been in business, in innovation, first in tech, then in green chemistry and cradle to cradle, um, purposeful businesses, and, and so on, and then circular economics all my career really and um and i um i saw this well i was sent um an encouragement to apply for a job and the job description and the sort of person description in that was so much like me that when i showed it to my brother he said oh is this somewhat something you've written yourself to manifest your perfect job description um and and given i wasn't really looking for a job at that point i thought i have to go and see these people um and and so I did, and I met um, the wonderful Sam Laka, who was the exec director of Volans at the time. She'd been one of the part of the co-founding team with John, and I met her, uh, both of them. And um, and John very kindly said, "I would, you know, I'd like you to come and join us as CEO and shake us up and reset the organization and how the thinking is happening and what we're thinking about, because this is going to be the most crucial." 15 years of my career it's getting really interesting <laughs> even more interesting and um and he he wanted Volans to be set up for more exponential change than it was at the time so that's how I joined um just about five years ago and it's been a, a, a wonderful um very busy ride since then so what we do now is again as i said we're looking at systemic change mainly through businesses and a lot of the work we do is really on transforming businesses helping helping to have the conversations on what is needed what is the path of that unique business to start start transforming for a regenerative future or a a planetary civilization we could actually live with um so so we're super professional and and we do everything based on research but we are absolutely not neutral where we have a we have a very big agenda and all our clients and our ecosystem know that and we um we work with that um, fairly fairly directly we also only work with companies and people that we really like because the work is it's hard, right? Um, for years, and I think um, John Elkington wouldn't mind me saying, you know, a lot of the work was about why companies and people should change. Um, I think we've got to the point in the last few years that the why is is fairly widely widely understood now. Companies have been trying to do a bit better and be more sustainable for the past few decades, largely due to John's work, original work. Um, so now it's about the how. And the how is always going to be difficult, uncharted waters. I had a text message 
last night from a client saying, I, you know, this is uncharted water for us. And I'm really grateful of how you're helping support us through this because it is that. So unless you like the people and unless you think you're going to have fun with it, you can't really do it. So I guess that's how, where we land now. And, and, and now we're, we're in Somerset house in London. We have, um, I guess roughly 16 people in our team. Um, we have a, a constellation team. So we have people who come in on certain projects. We have wonderful students who work part-time, but roughly around 16, I think we are now. And uh, companies across the world. So not many in England, actually. Um, in Finland, Spain, Brazil, Switzerland. Uh, where else? <laughs> Before we dive into the examples um, of the clients where I really think uh, it will will be very interesting uh, to, to sketch, you know, some of the examples. Um, let's start with uh, the first bullet point we prepared. When, when I personally, being involved now in sustainability professionally for 15 years, look at the overall market of sustainability uh, through a lens of the bell curve, mm -hmm. we always see I would say the radical innovators at the very beginning, you were mentioning the terminology uncharted waters. Then we see the early adopters. Then we see the, the, the biggest chunk, which is, I would say, adopting less bad behavior, right? Yeah. So when, when, when I look at Volans, where would you personally uh, position uh, both your, your work and, and your clients through that lens? So, so we, we are lucky. We tend to get to work at that one end of the bell curve, the, the people who are seeing, understanding that radical change has to happen, who have probably done all the less bad for a while. Um, you know, they have, they have all the accreditations and so on. Uh, we tend to refer to that group, by the way, as the sort of responsible businesses. It's the responsibility feature, which is really important. Um, you know, you need to know what your impact is, measure it, manage it, and so on. However, that's not going to get us where we need to get. Um, there has to be this quite severe shift in mindset and in how we think about it. And that's what we try and help with is, is the early adopters um, which is the dangerous water, right? It, it really is because you don't know that it's 100% going to work. Um, so, so we are definitely placing ourselves there and, and, and only working with those where it's clear that the leadership are looking for high am ambition levels, looking to, to, um, to do something different. Um, that said, I think all businesses also have to consider the risk um, the, and, and they have to tick the other boxes. What we're finding, interestingly, is often some of the companies that do best because of that is family owned businesses because they are by nature looking into the longer term. So it, it's so that, that's where I would sit ourselves, you know, and and when we talk about. I don't know if this is the right place to so stop me if I'm going off. Um, but the when we talk about sustainability, really, in a sense, it was it was never going to get there. If, if you know, it's easy to say looking in the in the rear rear mirror, but but to sustain something, nothing in nature is sustained. It, it dies. There's rebirth. Um, there's it's dynamic and and changing all the time and yet we as humans would love everything just to be <laughs> sustained and calm and can we just get to that state um so one of the mindset shifts i think that has to happen is we have to know that we will never get there um and that there will be these ups and downs and we have to start building our systems and our organizations um to be able to cope with that and to be able to flourish in that dynamic piece um since i think uh, the best value add for the listeners is to oscillate on a meta level so the mm -hmm. paradigmatic level that structures the way uh, the markets work mm -hmm. but i want to start now with uh, some some examples and ideally you give a couple of examples where let's say the uncharted waters are not 
uh, too rough where you could sketch examples of where you see the needle moving into the right direction. Mm -hmm. And also uh, a couple of examples where, where you would say uh, it's, it's a pretty bumpy ride. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and maybe as a last point that I would like to incentivize you that you could uh, give uh, examples of uh, various um, uh, industries sure. and uh, ecosystems. Sure. Um, so if I start with the, the easier one, I think the, um, so we've been working with the Finnish company Neste. So it's the biggest company in Finland. It was set up to secure um, Finland's energy needs um, back in the day. So it's an oil company originally when it was set up and we've been working with them for four and a half years, I guess. Um, and the, the piece we've been working with them on, so they've been on a transformation journey for, for more than a decade now on moving from being this local oil company to being a global leader in renewables. That was always their sort of their view and, and their, their path, not always, but for, for a while. And, um, and we came in because the CEO really wanted to accelerate into new markets that, that where the, there was a gap. So into specifically, uh, so both accelerate into um, sustainable aviation fuel, um, into circular polymers, um, because again, um, and renewable uh, circular renewable polymers, I should say, and then ensure that their sustainability was um, that they were constantly pushing at the edge and the highest ambition of sustainability possible. And so for them, what we did is we set up a, an advisory council. Um, so a council of, I guess we're six of us, who come from very different industries, NGOs, expertise areas, who are constantly um, challenging challenging the teams in the business and the leadership team on what their ambition level should be. Should they be going in to this new market? In and, and if so, in which way? What are the what are the risks and um, and the sort of accelerators that they could use. So that has been, I think, a fairly smooth ride, partly because the whole organization was so aligned with that, that, you know, so we've done for them things like um, with the, within the council, you know, the future of the internal combustion engine, that their, their, their solution is this wonderful drop-in renewable fuel. So you can drop it into an ex existing, um, existing car um, engine but of course if if europe or countries then ban the internal combustion engine um in favor of electrics then what do you do so so we so it's not like everything it's smooth sailing so you have to you know how do you deal with that as a company how do you ensure that you don't just become the the medium term solution so we've been dealing with some of those but in a fairly consistent way and partly that is due to to the organization itself they are very thorough they listen they come back they use the council in a in a in a really solid way so that's one example so energy industry um one that was slightly bumpier <laughs> um, but also super exciting was um the spanish company um aciona so it's a big spanish infrastructure company they've um they have interests across the world so they build um they build water sanitation they build housing they build um metro systems I, i'll talk to that in a bit all the different things family owned they have for a long time been leading in sustainability within the spanish um uh, corporate um, sphere and um so they've their tagline has been business as unusual for literally almost a decade you know they they've always wanted to do that and um and the way we came in with them was we we were asked to help refresh their five year sustainability plan uh, which is not something we often do um funnily enough often we we will will do we don't do sustainability planning but we worked with 30 i think 34 of their sort of younger leaders across the world for four months to figure out what does it, a refresh look like? What are the, the pillars? What are the, what's the DNA they wanted to, to weave through? And um, that was very, very tough because the way we work is quite emergent. So it's bespoke to that company. We don't have a step-by-step -step guide that we know exactly how it, this, is, this process is gonna spit out the perfect plan for them. And about halfway through, 
they were, you know, this is an engineering company. Engineers, thankfully, are very focused on detail and precision, and they know exactly what's going to happen in the next few steps. So they were deeply uncomfortable, um, really, um, with it, several of them. Um, and they sort of, at one point, maybe halfway through, said, we're not sure, you know, we don't know where this is going. When we ask you to, <laughs> what comes next, it's like, well, that depends on what you do in this phase. So it was it was really tough. It was tough for them. It was tough for us. It wasn't even the outside that had caused the issue. Um, but we, we got to a really, really solid point, again, um, where they didn't come up with it. They said, we haven't come up with a five-year sustainability master plan refresh. We've come up with a 10-year plan and we want that plan not just to be a sustainability plan. This should be the strategy for the company. And that is what they presented, which was always the plan that they were going to present to the CEO and chair um, and some board members. And brilliantly, that leadership team said, OK, we're going to take some of this on then. And so they did do a five year plan, too. But they they adopted it as a bigger strategic move. Um, so in addition to business as unusual, um, regenerative by design became became sort of one of their slogans and 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 building a little bit on that in terms of um so so they they really then have gone deep and said well, so what does it mean if we're going to build in a regenerative way not just a sustainable responsible less impact way what does that mean for all our indicators um and that means we're going to have to really understand the local context. We're going to have to have longer term plans for that local context. One of my favorite examples, which came up in our work with them was, um, so you get asked to, to build a bridge in a Spanish town. And, um, and normally the KPIs for that are, what, how fast can you build it? What's the cost? Potentially, what are the materials? You know, Can we reduce the carbon or, or make it slightly greener? Great. From a, from what they have produced with us is this regenerative handbook or playbook for their business development team. That's not what they look at. They say, well, in this area, what's the biodiversity like? What are the jobs that need to be created? And so on and so forth. And in a very simple example, um, in that area of Spain that we're looking at the bridge, in 10 years, that will be 10 degrees hotter. If you put a bridge there, increase the traffic flow at that point of in that local area, you're going to increase the health risk to people many, many fold because, of course, heat and more exhaust fumes. Um, um, and even if we've all gone to EVs, there's still um, a lot of pollution from the tires at this point. So you don't want to build a bridge. <laughs> you actually want to look at again so their whole piece now is about how do you look at the whole system and then and here comes the troublesome thing is how do you have that conversation with the local council member who has the responsibility for building that bridge and does not have the responsibility for the health or um you know or for what happens in 10 years because quite frankly he'll be retired but but so so they are you know so they've found that as they've gone in they've had to now also create some of the pull in the market for these things um which is a really different skill set that they are now building that muscle on how do you how do you get that how do you figure that out and an example um that I just saw last week. So I went to Brazil and th where they are building the next um, metro line in Sao Paulo, the same company. And um, and I was very lucky to get to see it, which is very impressive. I've not been to such a big um, excavation before and, and industrial uh, drilling is incredible. But the really interesting thing is, so this metro line goes from the favela in the north, well, where an area where 70% live in the slums into the center. So that in itself is interesting. It cuts the travel time from one hour, 53 minutes to 23 minutes. So people who are commuting to, to be cleaners and dustbin men and whatever actually can get back and forth without spending three hours a day on that. Or actually, it's almost four hours a day. I can't count. Um, but what they've done is the financing for that. Um, Athiona um, and they've, they're doing it in a consortium, have linked the finance of it to... Um, to KPIs that are social, that are about the social standing. So they have to provide professional training, certified professional training 
um, for this many hours every year in order to maintain the financing. They have to do women's empowerment. They have to invest and support electric mobility startups. They have to um, support innovation within those local areas with very solid KPIs year on year, this many, um, in order to do so. Or they, um, they will have to pay a penalty. They will have to pay somebody else to do it if they miss the target. So tying themselves through the financing of it to having this much broader way of thinking um, is really interesting. And those are the kinds of things that they're working with, but it's, it takes a long time. It's really bumpy because you can create the most beautiful regenerative idea, but if there's no market for it, you, you end up um, either having to create it or, or most companies actually would give up. So I think it's, it's really admirable that, that they've, they've kept going with this and they, they definitely are. And they're seeing the benefits. Um, one of their um, casing manufacturers now who, um, so these concrete casings that go around the, the tunnels of the Metro, 70% of the people there working there are women. And, they, and, and these KPIs are not just, oh, we should do something for women. It's they did an analysis of the context of the local area and then figured out what could help this area the most in the long term. So, th so anyway, that's a couple of examples. Um, those are both heavy industry. The other example that we ran into, I guess slightly bumpy, but it was we worked with the Selfridges Group. So the luxury department store group, it spanned Canada, Ireland, the Netherlands and the UK. And we worked with them on, on innovation, I guess. They, they decided that they wanted to reinvent retail for a sustainable future. But what does that mean? What's the what's the role of a luxury department store um, in a sustainable future? Is it even possible? And so we did some work with them in 2021 for a few months. Again, you, um, working both with the management team, so all the managing directors of the businesses and the um, um, people across the the, um, the group. So at different levels, finance, data, digital um, buyers, and so on. And they um, came up with a few very specific um, areas that they could focus on to really um, to really innovate themselves and, and reinvent retail as they wanted to for something useful. And, and what we've seen, you know, so all great. And we got to the end of that project and then it was announced that the group had been put up for sale by the owners. Again, family, it was actually family ownership the patriarch had had passed away sadly and and some of those so that was all put on hold for almost a year i guess um which again lots happened in a year as you know um the good news is that out of it has come that only a few weeks ago um the selfridges uk part announced some um, targets so that within the next 8 years 50% of all their revenues will come from rental, repair, uh, rrr, refill, and another R that I now can't remember. Um, but Maybe recycle. Recycle, there you go, probably. Um, so the four, basically, so they're basically saying we are going to, one of the things that had come out was this idea of circularity and changing what you get in a department store. And the fact that they've now set these targets and worked out roughly I think how how do they need to change their business models for that so they're not just pouring um, pouring new products out into a market? So that again, some bumps and some different industries. Just three of them. I'll stop talking now. It's a long time. Yeah, let's bounce forth and back, um, the, like the meta level, because I really think it's needed uh, also for yeah. those who those listeners who are not so deep into the weeds of sustainability as us. So let's just for the sake of the exercise, uh, sketch their businesses mm -hmm. uh, who, who score amazing on the financial bottom line mm -hmm. and they don't care about the future and about sustainability, mm -hmm. which is actually very favorable, right? Because they can externalize as many costs as possible. And usually outside of the organizational boundaries, right? You don't really need to pay for the generations to come or climate change or soil erosion and stuff like that. Then we have in the middle of the bell curve, 
in sustainability, those that you would coin in your terminology, responsible businesses mm-hmm. that you're challenging, you know, to really revamp at the very core of the yes. business model to work towards more than just less bad or just yes. net zero to really bake into the DNA of the organizations, a regenerative paradigm. For me, a regenerative paradigm could mean something like, okay, we have plastic pollution, both mixed plastic and single plastic. What do we do with all that rubbish, right? And how can we uh, build a sustainable business model um, out of that? So I would like to kind of go deeper in our conversation and try to look at examples that you are Mm -hmm. aware of yeah where you would see exemplary that a regenerative paradigm is already in work and where that could scale yeah Um, so i was actually pretty amazed by the example of this new metro line because i really think it's a good example how much more an infrastructure company that would by definition not necessarily need to care about like poverty and uh, all sorts of like let's say fancy non-financial key performance indicators as to empower women for example Mm -hmm. um so um i wonder maybe they're smaller in size but but who are those who are already in the in the bucket of a a regenerative i'll just um take one step back for a second just yeah for me the regenerative is really interesting i love the way you frame it with the first you know the externalities people who don't care and and i guess that for me is the regenerative shift is and the difference from responsibility is you're tying yourself and the success of your organization you're understanding that that's part of the system's success and that you will never succeed if the whole system doesn't succeed so you're you're really internalizing externalities but also working on getting the rest of the system to flourish around you because it's it's exactly that and that's why I love that metro example it was it was stunning and and they were so passionate the team that that are doing it that it's wonderful um it's there are not many you know the good news is there are little examples like that for big businesses where they go oh let's try this um it's still experimental um i and i i think the the thing about regeneration and and examples of it is it has to almost be local um because then you can then there is some boundary to to that system that you're looking at so um the the one one of the places i i like that is slightly different is in scotland um, we've been working a little bit with the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, <laughs> um, who um, a few years back, a, a woman, a project manager there called Pauline Silverman, she um, she went out to look at the Leven, the mouth of the River Leven, which is just northeast of Edinburgh, so out towards Europe. And she couldn't find the river. She knew that it was, you know, it'd been polluted and so on. And then she found it. There was no more salmon it was overgrown, so on. And she could have said, oh, okay, so our job is going to be, how do we re- revitalize the river and the river banks? Great. This is what the Environmental Protection Agency does, right? Instead, what she did, and partly because um, her organization, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, have been going through this transformation to try and do something more. Um, she she created an alliance of, I guess, 12 partners, and I can't rattle them all off, but they included the local council, of course. It in- included Diageo, the you know um, global uh, drinks company, which happened to have some production there, included the railways and the Scottish water and, and a bunch of other, both private and non-private stakeholders. And she brought them together in the Leven partnership to regenerate not just the environmental bit of that area, but the financial, the human, and uh, the the economic, and the and the uh, and human and social, I guess, because it happens to be one of the poorest, most deprived areas in Scotland. So, so they have now pulled together and are realizing that uh, you know that you can. So Scott Rail have now extended the railway line out. Again, it's funny how infrastructure is important, right? So those people can 
can can can travel more easily. There are educational system um, programs going in and training going in so that they can have climate ready housing, which they don't have, which means that, by the way, they'll pay less for the energy, as we all know, at this point in time is really important. But all those things. So they have a, a so she's structured it and really is a, a lot down to her. Obviously, she would say it's a, it, the team and so on. And it's the partnership. But all these people have come together and have seen the symbiosis and the working together is going to be more valuable than having one project that works here or one project that works there. So I think I think Diageo, you know, they're doing a big um, hydrogen powered plant up there now. So those, I think that is really interesting. And for me, it's exemplary. It's going slowly, um, probably potentially because it's it's got so many actors and so on, but they're doing incredibly well. And it's had me thinking about uh, on a slightly meta of, of level on how do you finance systems? And do we need a new asset class that these finance people who you're talking about who make a lot of money um, can invest in the whole system? And we calculate that there's more value um, in those projects that are going on in the leave-in, for example, than if you added up the value of each of them. I, I, I like that. Let's let let's stay there. So I would like to group or pool both the leave-in example and the metro example and zoom out from an ecosystemic perspective because what we now need is not only new ways of governance, mm -hmm. new ways of leadership, new job titles. So pretty much of what I'm doing very intuitively as an agent on behalf of a whole portfolio of organizations is these are very complex multi-stakeholder surroundings, state actors, non-state actors, uh, ph ph philanthropy, uh, foundations, but uh, uh, small and medium-sized business, family-owned business, for-profit businesses, um, stock market listed businesses. Yeah with like vastly different ontologies on how to operate. Yes. Um, and also, the, lastly, what you mentioned, also we need new finance mechanisms. Um, are, since, since you both know a little bit of the Leven example and the Metro example, um, how do the organizations that are like instigating that, how, how, how do they deal with, with the complexity? Because usually they could say, well, it's not part, right, of yeah. our organizational boundary. Why even bother, right? Mm -hmm. It costs us a lot of like money that ultimately, you know, um, gets does does not necessarily get reflected on the on the financial bottom line. Absolutely. At least not short term or mid term, yeah. right? Yeah. No, and and that's that's exactly what's interesting, right? Is there's no reason for either of those organizations to do that, really. And and this is one of the reasons I highlighted Pauline, because um, because actually, this the, I think we live in such an interesting time where where the crisis around us <laughs> um, have have become internalized in so many people. There are lots of people who are blinkered, who are still drugging themselves with media and sugar and alcohol and drugs and whatever fine but so many people have internalized that that crisis we're in climate societal um let's just stick with those two <laughs> financial energy you can keep going but but um uh, and they are and their impetus to act in a bigger way and figuring out the way is um is strong enough and they happen to have people in other places that allow that, right? So in the Levin example, the CEO of SEPA had been working for a few years on saying, we should not just be fining companies, we should be helping them to, to change. In the case of um, Athiana, they've been working on, well, how do, how do we have a more regenerative world? They still have a very severe you know, bottom line, Athiana shares are going up, up, up all the time, as far as I can tell. The um, but the human beings in there have somehow given themselves permission, um, and the organisation have allowed it to do something else, to invest in those complicated um, relationships. And I think it this is where the transformation we need does come down to human beings in many ways. That um, 
and, and and I guess one of the big mindset shifts that has to happen is from simple to complex, from from thinking we can live in spreadsheets to to understanding that everything has a feedback loop and 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 we can't even if it looks good on the spreadsheet that we're improving all these indicators social environmental and financial it's never it's not enough because all the things between the the relationships between the the um are are where the value really is now and so it comes back to humans and 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 i guess where allowing humans to rewise themselves um you know people talk about unlearning and i think that's right but but i think the new learning is actually rewising and 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 connecting with themselves with nature with each other in a very different way um without sounding too soft on it but that a lot of what we do in, in in our workshops is that is allowing people to just step out of the the simplistic rules that they've operated by so i think that's why that's that's the only thing i can that can tell you is that i think it's got to be the human side of it which we've ignored for so many years right economic man is not exactly very human no it no, no it's not i have the feeling let's let's live conspire <laughs> on, on on my biggest moonshot that i was just sketching in in our preparation osaka world expo 2025 yes. how can we showcase ecosystem demonstrators that showcase that on a level of moving from ownership to stewardship to showcasing that we can't think in spreadsheets, but in like symbiotic relationships and homeostasis that show that on a governance level, very complex uh, projects can be successfully built, both from voting mechanisms to ownership um, to showcasing ecosystem demonstrators on a bioregional level. So I find it very interesting that without us preparing for it, we actually have a multi-billion dollar infrastructure project mm -hmm. that at least from how I perceive it, um, has enough of um, integrated, um, not I would not call them data points, um, has enough of the tapestry where we can showcase something like that oh. and the leaven example what would be when you when you look at these like dozens of projects that you that you're involved in uh, uh, all over the planet what's the right scope and size because my understanding is they need to be sufficiently big right to to be able to really say look this is a multi-billion dollar infrastructure project in, in uh, where was it, in Rio or Sao Paulo? In Sao Paulo. In it's Sao the biggest Paulo. infrastructure project in Brazil ever, by yeah, the way. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so, so ideally, you could showcase that the monetary flows, the circularity, yeah. um, uh, whatever, uh, women's empowerment, all that um, moves differently. And the same with the Leaven example. What would be other, like, Let's just for the sake of the exercise, call them yeah. ecosystem demonstrators that showcase the regenerative paradigm B. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? Because um, there are a lot, I believe there are lots, I can't pick the specifics because, um, but I believe there are lots within the regenerative agriculture piece, of course. Um, the um, That just seems to be done or being done. So we haven't gone gone too close to the not because we're not interested i think the food systems is fascinating um and and what they're doing i think that's one place that there would be some um and i'm sure I, i'm sure i know them but i can't i can't name them um where again how do you again they they would all i think and if we if i'm imagining osaka and, and and several places i could imagine them on a map on a on a on a very big map because they would have to be they are local um and i think the thing about regeneration is that you can have this massive scale and or impact in in terms of impact like the um the sao paulo line six the orange line six that we will soon have <laughs> um is massive but but you can't scale it from there and say oh we're going to just keep going you can replicate that kind of thing and i think that's what we're looking for right similarly with the leaven they've actually also gone to somewhere else in Scotland. exactly that's what i mean also with scale so, so yeah. don't get me wrong obviously it doesn't need to but 
it should be able to replicate the templates, the learning, yeah. uh, the weaving of the tapestry of the multi-stakeholder, yeah. the governance piece, the new financial uh, mechanisms yes. to make them able to be bankable and to yes. absorb more mainstream capital. This is yeah. actually what, what we're looking for in the next yeah. few years, hopefully, right? No, I think that's exactly what we need. Um, so I'm just thinking of, of other areas that where I've seen this. I, it, it's, it's not that usual. It's That's the the interesting thing i think that right now and, and you know energy and infrastructure and when somehow we've we've been energy infrastructure and finance for some reason seem to come at us a lot but i think that is because those are sort of foundational industries that need to go first and they are under more pressure because they're that consume so many could you could, yeah. you could you sketch an example from the finance sector Oh, um, sure. So the financial sector, it's slightly different. Um, um, I've got involved with it because one of the things we discovered through our work with businesses was just that there was a there's a massive gap between business, um, even businesses who want to transform and how do they get finance? And as you know, we've just shown that that new ways are coming up all the time. But so so I got involved with um with banks and in the UK set up a, a small initiative called Bankers for Net Zero, uh, where we basically brought banks together with industry and small, and this was small and medium businesses to say, okay, so why is the capital not flowing towards net zero initiatives in, in industry? Um, and, and, and with a view to, well, if there's any policy issues, so one of the partners was British Parliament, one of the groups in there. Um, and, could we could we make some recommendations that would make this easier? Um, so banks are having to transform too, of course. Um, and as I see it, they have to transform from being either we invest or we divest to having to help support building new markets that don't exist yet. Because one of the biggest pushbacks I got when speaking to some bank CEOs were like, well, you know, if we decide we're going to come out of fossil fuels, then our team is just going to be taken by somebody else. And there's just going to be a gap there. So, um, so the conversations I've been having with them was like, well, how do you, instead of just coming out of fossil fuels, how do you help with all the might of your, your bank um, and, and, and the financial leverage, how do you help the, that industry transform from fossil fuels to, to something else, which is what we all need, to, where they should be putting their money. But um, but it's really contested. I, I, you may have seen in the last few days that the um, the Global Financial Alliance on Net Zero, the banking you know alliance, um, several U.S. banks are now saying they're going to pull out because they're worried about being sued because they think they'll miss their targets, their fossil fuel targets. Um, and so it's a bigger risk to them still that they might get sued for missing their targets than. <laughs> Then they see the risk of, of of trying to hit those targets. Um, I, and I, I, yeah. In as much as I see, it, this will always be. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The, the dialectic. And I think what we're seeing. I don't even reality, think it's right? pendulum, Alistair. At the moment, I think it's the death throes, of, of. I think a lot of people are making an awful lot of money, on the last few years, of dying industries. And we're seeing that kickback <laughs> and it's kind of awful, but it has always happened. I think people made more money on CFCs in the last two years before they were finally globally banned than they did in the 20 years before that. So, um, I mean, that's the, that's the nature of capitalism. I, I wonder if we can live sketch an example that I just had a download on. So I know you met Indy, Indy Johar from Dark Matter Labs, the CEO, and I want to quickly sketch the Highline effect. So when the Highline was built uh, in New York, um, the project that Dark Matter Labs did uh, was that basically the whole of the Highline could have been paid for with just a small cutout of the land value uplift adjacent to the Highline. So now that we know the Orange Line 6 will be built, how could we make how could we include like big banks mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil mm -hmm. to make use of the very likely quote unquote line six orange effect yeah. and have them 
actually include new customers, bottom of the pyramid, most mm -hmm. likely most of them won't even have a bank account, yeah. where they could actually build a new customer base, which grows their business, yeah. but at the same time include people through that pendulum of the land value uplift yeah. that will happen most certainly towards the areas um, out of the favelas and, and yeah. closer um, to the city. So yeah. I think this could be a very interesting example to build a consortium kind of on top of the infrastructure layer and sense into new banking mechanisms. This yeah, is I just what came. Yeah, right? no, super interesting. And and interestingly, I think that in the consortium financing, I think are 12 banks. So it would be really interesting to see um because they will be talking all the time whether whether those are the banks that you just tap into and and, and we're talking about billion bil, billions of uh, uh like and i don't know most likely it's said trillions i don't know what the converting is in 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 rice um so i wonder how do we best ground that um when i look at the next decade ahead mm -hmm. and it's very intentional that I set myself Osaka in three years only as my uh, personal moonshot I think we have enough concepts enough prototypes and experiments big enough I mean both the Leven and the, mm -hmm. the orange line six um, can absorb billions of bankable products Yeah. yet to be made so to say whole new asset classes indy would call them civic assets um so i wonder when you think i always call it like the planetary civilization ahead yes and let's ground that maybe in in your volans thinking yeah. when you think three years ahead where do you want to move with volans what is the typology of projects and the typology of clients that you want to attract to really have leverage and ripple effects with these projects oh that's a big one uh, <laughs> that's a big one to ground it in um oh um so if i ground it in volans i think as i indicated i think there's more work to be done on kind of relating inner and outer things, local and global pieces. Um, again, always bridging, and I think we've done this since before my time at Volans, from pioneers into mainstream. There's, I think those are some of our roles, is, is these bridging and connecting roles, um, which are not new. Um, I think... I think our challenge will be to uh, it's back to the beginning of the the podcast actually is to to really invest in and find the companies that have the potential for radical shifts um which means they have to be able to deal with the radical uncertainty we're sitting with now um and rather than the companies that are wanting to be ahead and wanting to be um, at the forefront of the sustainability agenda and yet are too addicted to their own business models to um, to be able to break free of them. Um, and I guess uh, that can play out in several ways. Um, some companies have already split out. So Solve chemical company, um, have literally split their business Ford have split their business so it's re I think it's fascinating to see this and and in in a sense what I'm seeing is a decision to let an old part an old business that was the core business die and they wouldn't say that of course out loud but 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 I'm seeing those moves so the more we can help that I think um in terms of organizational type in terms of our type it really for me is all about flourishing and it's about um allowing that people to connect to, to wisdom and to flourish within our clients and within the team here um 
So that's probably not answering your question, but it's, but that's it's not, but, but maybe we're also not at the end of the dialogue. I want to stay on the infrastructure level and, and just kind of incentivize you. So, so I think to build on top of the infrastructure layer and, and, and include some of the work that you have already done uh, to uh, really think about um, bottom of the pyramid products um, and think adjacent uh, business opportunities uh, to line six, that's one. The second one that comes up, I know that plastic pollution in like um, in, in countries like Brazil, right, is, is, a, is a huge topic. So they could really also think of adjacent business models. I mean, mm -hmm. imagine if the poorest of the poor could pay in single use PET bottles yeah. that you hand in like the metro stations. Anyhow, they need to be built, I don't know, five, eight, 10, 12, 25 metro stations. Why not include uh, an additional layer of yes. um, you know, um, including Collection. single yes. single use or even mixed uh, use of plastic, right? Because I know this is done in various other um, cities. So maybe this then rather a question uh, uh, bouncing in your direction. Maybe then also um, the future of Volans could result in different business models. Mm -hmm. because i reckon so far it's 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 purely or or mainly consulting right but it could also be like instigating uh yes. business models yeah no absolutely and yeah. and funnily enough it well, our full name is Bolland's ventures so i see more ventures coming um right now you're right there's there's some consulting or advisory and then there is oh that's my dog shaking um there's um there's think tank work, research work, and looking further into the future. So those are the two quite different business models that we're playing with. And I, there will be more for sure that we will have to, we will have to take our own medicine, right? Um, and venture into to business models that haven't been seen before. Um, I think one of the challenges for people like us and others who've come out of the sustainability industry is the... Um, is that there's been a um a sense of oh we just do everything for free then so and then and then people because we're doing good stuff people should just give us the money from somewhere and i don't think that is a viable long-term model absolutely not absolutely not um, no, no, no. But, we're, we're uh, both too long into the business to sign but sign um to, but i uh, but no, i think no. there's a uh, there's 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 so much scope for ventures and actually that was some of the things that i spoke with india about was what are the ventures that could could shift the world in in different ways yeah so so i'm ending this podcast with uh first of all a lot of gratitude thanks louise for your precious time secondly with a lot of exciting ventures in the next few years ahead and thirdly I consciously started the series of podcasts, not in one-on-one -on -one sessions, but in group dialogues. Oh, interesting. Then I was incentivized to dive deeper into one-on-ones. I now sense that with some of the people that know each other, also some of the people that don't know each other, I see another uh, series more in a, in a group uh, dialogue setting, which I really think uh, could be super interesting also for the listeners. So for today, thank you, Louise. And if you have some closing words, then. Yeah, oh, no, um, just nice. uh, just thank you. I, I think it's so important, um, both, you know, the title of radi <laughs> catalyzing radical change is, is what we all have to do. And what for me gives me hope is that I'm seeing people act. And, and I think we just all have to be activists like you are. So thank you for having me. Thanks, Louise. Thanks. Bye. Bye.